Okay, we will get started with our broadcast. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Campbell. I'm the Vice President of Operations at PASIC. I'm the staff lead for the Risk Officers Forum, and I'm your moderator for this afternoon's broadcast. We started just a little bit late. People are filtering in right now. So welcome, everybody, and welcome if this is your first time joining our broadcast. Um, I'm going to thank colleague, or my colleague, Danica Halls, working behind the scenes to make sure this broadcast goes smoothly. So thank you, Danica, for that. Encourage everyone to sit back and relax. We have 90 minutes of discussion on the risks of generative artificial intelligence, which I think you'll find very fascinating. The agenda for today, I'm going to walk through some housekeeping items. Then I'm going to call on our CEO, Alistair Campbell, to uh, give some words of welcome. Then back to me, I'll present our, our speaker, Dr. Charles Dugas, and then close with an overview of some of the upcoming events uh, to close out our 2024 program and satisfaction survey. So everyone is very familiar with our platform, the MS Teams platform. You see the taskbar up there. We ask that we want to make this very interactive. So we ask you to raise your hand if you have a question or, your, or a comment throughout the broadcast, just Use the uh, the taskbar there to raise your hand. You'll be recognized. We ask you to turn on your your um, microphone, and you can turn on your video and uh, present your question or your comment. And then we'll address that in real time during the broadcast. That will help to guide discussion. I find that very informative. Um, one thing we're going to do today to make this more interactive is we have some poll questions that we're going to embed in the chat and uh, Danica is going to explain how that's going to happen as we do this. I think the first one comes up after slide number four, but we're going to ask for your comments in real time. Um, our speaker Charles is going to pose some questions and get your feedback on those and um, and then maybe dive a little bit deeper into uh, some of your thoughts about the, the questions that are going to be asked. I think we have three questions that we're going to ask throughout the broadcast. Um, it's our first time using this poll function on Teams, so it, it may be an issue. I know we had an issue in the past with some companies' firewalls. So uh, when you answer the the question, when you answer in the poll, if it doesn't accept your answer right away, it's because we have a firewall issue with with your firm. So I'll be asking about that in the um, satisfaction survey that will follow. Um, so let's now, uh, or actually, a couple of other issues: the antitrust compliance. The Competition Act is in place throughout the broadcast. You are competitors. You continue to be competitors in the broadcast. We're not colluding here at all. Our lawyers like to hear that. And the meeting is being recorded, so the broadcast will be put on our website for later rebroadcast if uh, if that's convenient to you or colleagues that were not able to attend today. So I'm going to throw over now to our CEO, Alistair Campbell, who's going to bring you up to date with some initiatives uh, recent initiatives at PASIC, and then I'll take it back and introduce our speaker, and we'll get on with the uh, the broadcast. Thank you. Thanks so much, you, uh, Ian. Uh, this will be uh, very brief uh, yeah, because I am very eager, as I suspect uh, everybody is, to to hear uh, about this uh, very topical topic. Uh, but very quickly on the kind of PASIC update uh, side of things, uh, the major uh, modernization step forward for us was the successful embedding of an inflator into our uh, coverage limits uh, going forward. Uh, we uh, got the approval of our board for this last uh, November. We have a process in which we have to secure the unanimous consent of 10 provinces and three territories, uh, which we received effective March 4. Uh, and that allowed uh, our board to confirm uh, the first uh, incorporation of CPI into our personal property and uh, personal auto limits, which will take effect uh, Canada Day, July 1 of this year. Uh, not a small step for us because for so long we've been kind of a, a step change organization when uh, pressures came to make a change. Uh, now we are just going to run uh, consistently in a more organized way. And I think everybody's feeling quite comfortable that this is the right way to go uh, forward. Uh, we're deep, uh, elbows deep in a process of an application for a bridge insurer with OSFI. Uh, we are exploring a range of scenarios for broadening our liquidity solutions in a crisis, medium and longer term options, which could potentially benefit from having a PASIC secure a rating 
uh, from S and P, Moody's, uh, Fitch, uh, DBRS, etc., that would allow us uh, in a crisis uh, to uh, raise debt capital on behalf of the industry. We're uh, working hard on that project. You'll hear more about that in the fall. Uh, and we are uh, working incredibly hard right now to prepare for a really important desktop uh, exercise. Uh, with the uh, British Columbia Financial Services Authority, which will explore what happens at the tipping point after the major quake uh, and the uh, initial failure uh, of some PASIC members. Uh, we have participation from OSFI, from Finance Canada, from other members of CCIR, uh, and it is uh, a really important next step forward in the work we're trying to do to get all of Canada uh, thinking properly about the need for some form of backstop mechanism to address the systemic risk associated with uh, a known uh, uh, risk, which we will in due course experience, ideally not in our lifetimes, but uh, no kidding, uh, this will happen and we should be ready in advance. So that's a, a quick pre-see of the PASIC uh, kind of work plan, uh, and the team is hard at work at it. But in the meantime, I'm really thrilled with the way this series of risk officers events has been curated by Ian. Uh, and I think between this and the and the forever plastic uh, uh, topic that we're going to cover in the fall, two of the biggest emerging risks for the industry are right on our agenda. And I think uh, we have exactly the right speaker uh, to speak to it today. Uh, with regard to regenerative AI. So Ian, over to you. Thanks very much, Alistair. My pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Charles Dugas, Executive Vice President of Coyos Intelligence. Charles is a veteran of the industry. He founded AppStat Technologies in 2001 with three partners, one being Yashua Bengio. And I don't know if you saw this, but a few weeks ago in the Globe and Mail, there was an article that uh, flagged Joshua, uh, he was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people of 2024. And he has spearheaded the University of Montreal's initiative to create the Montreal Declaration for the Responsible, Responsible Development of AI. So I'm curious if um, Charles has some uh, comment uh, about that, that uh, being a former business partner. Charles was a prof of actuarial science at the University of Montreal. He's well-versed in insurance applications related to data strategy, governance, warehousing, business intelligence, machine learning, and AI. If he seems familiar to you, uh, he is. Six years ago, we had Charles on uh, at a webinar in the fall of 2018 to talk about machine learning and AI, introduce us to that. So it's been a lot of developments since then. We thought it'd be a great to, to bring Charles back to talk about some of those developments. He has worked at uh, EY, Aviva, the analytics firm FICO, Mercer, and Swiss Re. And you should know that Coyos Intelligence develops new technologies to redefine interactions between insurers, brokers, and customers. So I think he's ideally situated to uh, bring us up to date on the world of AI and the possible risks that you should know about. So Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, I guess you can um, call on Danica to put up in the chat when we want to move to the, the polling of attendees. We'll do that, So, uh, but over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very happy to be here again six years later uh, to discuss this, uh, this very important topic of uh, generative AI. Um, I know there's been lots of, uh, whoops, sorry. I'm just going to launch this stick. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussions uh, regarding generative AI, especially since uh, ChatGPT launched about a year and a half ago. Um, and now lots of insurers are um, either tinkering with the idea of playing with different use cases. Some are already uh, working uh, implementations. Um, so it's a very interesting field um, and also because developments keep uh, keep coming at us uh, on a very regular basis the the pace of innovation in this field is uh, is pretty uh, spectacular um, and so it, it's hard to keep track um, but um, I think uh, some of the key risks that we'll be discussing today um, should be top of mind um, if you plan to roll out uh, some of these use cases of generative AI 
So um, before I jump into discussing some of the risks, um, and there, there, there's a large number of them, I decided to focus on some of the, the most important. Um, but of course, I won't get into um, all of the aspects related to job displacement or um, uh, doomsday uh, scenarios that may come out. I'll try to focus on risks risks as they apply to insurers um, and how you should address them some so try to provide some uh, solutions uh, to address and mitigate these risks as much as possible um, so before going into the risks just want to mention a few key developments over the last decade uh, regarding generative ai so generative ai has been an idea that's been around for a longer time um, used to be that uh, um, a field of research was called the uh, natural language generation, which uh, tried to um, to develop uh, content automatically um, and, and generate text. Uh, that was a field of research, but it was very, very much canned or canned solutions or canned text. Uh, nowadays, uh, the models are, are much more uh, human like in their interactions. And this builds off of uh, some, some of the concepts that are listed here. I, I just wanted to highlight a few ones. Um, generative adversarial networks um, and attention mechanism were published both in 2014. So GANs, as they're often called, are very similar in their uh, working as the uh, Turing test that you may have heard of, where um, you have a generative model that tries to um, generate images or text uh, that is uh, realistic um, and you have a discriminator that tries to identify whether the text uh, that's been generated is, is really a real one and so you're throwing at the discriminator model um, different examples, real world examples and the ones that were generated by the generative model and so the, the discriminator's task is to identify which ones are generated by a model. And so initially, the discriminator is, is typically good at making these, these, uh, these calls, uh, but then the, the, generative, uh, the generative model gets trained to improve its performance until you get to the point where the discriminator is no longer able to differentiate the real world example versus uh, the ones that were artificial, artificially generated. And so that's uh, that's kind of the game that is used in the background to generate images, for example, or generate uh, cer certain uh, certain types of data. The attention mechanism it is applies to uh, sequential data and is able to capture the importance of different words, for example, if you think of, uh, of text or previous words, in predicting the next one. And when you think of large language models, um, they're really models that were trained to predict next word. And so the attention mechanism came in uh, to capture and, and allow to improve um, a lot on the performance of these uh, sequential model. Transformer architectures, uh, and so the, these two uh, uh, developments in 2014 were published uh, came out of the Joshua's lab in Montreal. The transformer architecture was published in 2017. It was from Google. Um, and the key uh, the key innovation here was the ability to, uh, it was very computational, whereas the previous architecture relied on sequential data and predicting. Um, there was a lot of, of complexity in uh, calculating or predicting the next word. Transformer architectures um, allow to drastically improve on the, the computational uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, predicting words. Um, and that spurred a, a lot of research and development, which led to uh, GPT models in 2018 that were published by OpenAI, which now comprise most of the, uh, which, which drive most of the large language models that we're seeing out there uh, today. So this is uh, very shortly some, some of the key developments and there, there's a lot of, of course, there's a lot of research happening um, and, and it, 
it'd be difficult to cover everything um, and go at depth, but I just wanted to highlight these, these key concepts. Now, when you think of, of generative AI in use cases, I think it helps to classify the use cases so that um, some of the, the use cases, when you look at them and you, you're able to classify them, you're able to quickly identify which should be the risks that are most important uh, for certain classes of risk uh, of, of use, case, use cases. So there are different dimensions uh, that you can use to classify use cases. So the first dimension is, is probably task types. Um, so one of the tasks that generative AI is able to accomplish is summarization. So for example, if you have a long meeting, you can automatically summarize um, generate a summary of that meeting uh, using generative AI. It will be able to capture the key concepts and generate uh, one or two page or, or a few pages summary of that of that meeting and also provide some action items and so on. So very interesting uh, type of application. Um, then you have interpolation, ex extrapolation, interpolation. Uh, you can think of some missing data from a picture, for example, and you try to interpolate and have a full view of, of the picture and, and a sample, uh, have a, an entire picture co complete. The extrapolation um, apply. An example of extrapolation is, is generating text. So um, when you have when you inter interact, for example, with ChatGPT, that's an example of extrapolation from the question that was asked or the prompt. Um, ChatGPT is able to provide a completion or an answer um, that extrapolating from that initial question. Um, then you have simulation, and simulation uh, represents creating a new object from a description. So you may think of uh, some of these uh, uh, tools out there where you can just describe the picture that you'd like to have displayed and that will uh, be generated and you'll get that image that corresponds to the description you gave. So these are task types and they can apply to different types of data. Um, and so types of data are varied. Um, so you get images, uh, you have music, voice, voice recording, uh, video uh, could be a video of a, um, a car accident uh, within a in, in entrance context. Then you have text and also code, and so code is is pretty important for uh, for programmers and it, within insurance as well. Generating code or writing code has been greatly accelerated uh, with generating generative AI. Um, then you get to action categories. Um, and so the types of actions that you, you can get are often described as in three categories. Um, you have decisions, and in the context of decisions, AI allows you to be more insightful and more accurate. And you can think, for example, in fraud detection, uh, where you can better model uh, the difference between fraudulent claims as, uh, versus uh, legitimate ones. Um, then you have tasks where you want to be more efficient. So as I mentioned, software development is one uh, where Gen AI helps a lot. Writing emails, so you can get a draft, initial draft email to work with, and then you can just uh, modify it a little bit. Um, the third one that's very interesting is interactions. And so you can think of chatbots. Uh, you can also think of IVR, so uh, interacting voice, uh, voice systems. Um, and there you want to be uh, more engaging. You also want to be effective uh, and efficient in your conversation. So quickly get to the point, understand the customer's intent and resolve that, uh, that intent. Um, so virtual assistance uh, is, is a great example. Um, and then the, the last two uh, elements uh, for categorization, human in a loop. So a key question is whether you want to automate a task or, or automate an action, uh, or you want it to be supported. Um, and so the risk will be much greater typically uh, if you want to fully automate uh, an action, uh, as opposed to having a human in the loop or, or someone review uh, the output of the generative AI. And so it's a, it's a significant step to go ahead and decide to automate 
uh, an action. And then you can have a hybrid solution where um, in some cases you may be able to fully automate an action. Uh, and in some other cases, uh, whether it be by uh, th because of the client's demand or because in the process um, you've decided to have someone review, uh, there may be some cases where uh, the AI is uncertain. And in, in that situation, uh, the Gen AI may, if you think of a virtual assistant, the virtual assistant may decide to refer to a human uh, to finalize the discussion with the client. And so these could be called hybrid solutions where you have some cases that are uh, fully automated and some others are, are being supported. And then you have the end user. Um, and so here um, you can differentiate between internal use cases. So um, example would be summary notes of meetings. So that would be an inter internal use case versus external cases where external facing uh, use cases where uh, these are meant to uh, uh, providing clients or other third parties uh, with, uh, with certain information. Um, so once you've, you've labeled or identified um, these categories for a use case, that allows you to um, better assess the potential risks later on. The focus of this presentation, I'll, I'll be mainly uh, focused on large language models because that's where we, we're hearing a lot of, uh, of use case potential. We're seeing lots of use case potential. Um, so as I'm mentioning, these are models that extrapolate. Uh, they can be used for text or voice. Uh, so you just need a speech to text uh, front end and then that becomes text. And then you can use the large language model to, um, to infer what should be the, uh, the interaction or the completion. Um, they are used for interactions with uh, often with clients. Um, you want to reach an automation situation and external facing. So you really thinking about uh, either virtual assistants on digital channel or, or, or on the phone. Um, adapting LLMs uh, with fine tuning, that's one approach. And so starting from a generic model, what you can do as companies and what a lot are, are trying to achieve is um, first of all, select uh, an existing uh, large language model that's out there. And from that initial model that's very generic, um, not necessarily trained for specific tasks, um, you will use your company data to adapt that model so that it gets better at a specific task. Um, and then once that model has been adapted, that is what is being deployed as a new specialized model. So the question is how far along the journey of generative AI is your company. And so the first one is you're educating uh, yourselves, uh, you're developing a strategy or you're planning. And so it's just uh, getting ready to uh, go ahead with generative AI. Um, the second step would be to run some proof of concept cases or pilots. Um, and then once you've done these proof of concepts or pilots, you can implement use cases, whether internally, so internal use cases, uh, and the last step, I guess, would be the most advanced step would be external facing use cases. So you might be um, in situation where you, you could check both uh, multiple answers. What I'm asking you is to check the, the, the lowest answer you can get to. So the most mature, I guess, uh, answer you can get So votes are still piling. So the majority so far, we can already see that uh, more than 50% have answered the first step. It's just education strategy and planning. Haven't jumped yet into um, use cases. And then pretty much at par, uh, POCs and pilots and internal use cases with 12 and 11 votes and then there's one vote for external facing use case. Um, so clearly there's uh, 
there's reluctance to implement Gen AI with external use cases, and uh, that's obviously a major step uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 jump uh, jump ahead and with uh, external facing use cases. I don't know if there's one person that that voted uh, that mentioned external use cases. I don't know if you want to comment on that or or talk about it a little bit. What essentially? How did you? Um, was was it difficult for you to get to that point of uh, accepting the risks? Um, and so the next question is, uh, th thanks for voting. So the next question is how far, no, that's, that was a right question. So the next question is, how is your company allowing you to use Gen AI tools? So corporate purpose is using specified enterprise tools got 10 votes, which is the most. Okay. Great. Here, I'll get back to the presentation. Um, so the first risks, uh, risks one and two are related to privacy and intellectual property. Um, so this is uh, regarding the data that your people might be using uh, or your clients might be using as they interact with uh, Gen AI models. The issue here is that according to terms of use, these model can allow themselves to use that data um, to further enhance their models, their model performance. Um, and so it it brings the the concern that some of the data that includes private data, confidential data um, could be released, or uh, that certain IP and you can think of code, for example, or or certain elements that you make um, share with the models might be released uh, to other third parties that will use later versions of these models. Um, so some examples of this, for example, ChatGPT, um, uh, OpenAI, um, OpenAI's ChatGPT exposes certain titles of, of uh, users' chat histories. Um, so that was a breach of, uh, of private information, confidential information, so privacy risk. Um, Italy uh, decided to ban temporarily ChatGPT over concerns regarding consent privacy uh, and also the accuracy uh, of the models so that there was a component of, of privacy. Um, GitHub, where that is uh, the site where you can uh, share some of your code, uh, code and software, um, GitHub has developed a co-pilot that allows you to in increase or improve your ability to generate code. Uh, GitHub was shown uh, susceptible to um, release some copyrighted material um, that wasn't necessarily intended for uh, redistribution, so that's IP risk. Um, and an, another example, final example, is Amazon asked its employees to refrain from using ChatGPT for fear of of uh, of releasing some of some of its IP, and so the solutions you should uh, look into is look at carefully at the terms of use of these large language models. So, uh, if your people are looking to uh, share some IP or some IP related uh, information with chat with certain large language models, you should make sure that this is not going to be reused. Uh, for for training purposes, and eventually that could eventually end up with uh, with some other uh, other people. And so, for example, large Llama three model from from Meta is open, uh, so you can deploy it on um, within your environment, making sure that it's not uh, being retrained with uh, with your own data. Um, regarding private uh, confidential data, so privacy risk. Uh, you'll want to anonymize your data prior to using large language models. Uh, so that's privacy and intellectual property. Um, the third risk is legal risk. And so this is a concern where 
your people are using a large language model or, or generative AI um, and may be using copyrighted material uh, without the permission. And in that context, uh, you may face charges that will lead to uh, litigation costs uh, and so on. This could have an impact on reputational damage and also if you get uh, an injunction on using certain outputs that could disrupt your operation potentially. Um, so some examples that have uh, recent examples, New York Times uh, went and decided to sue OpenAI and Microsoft because OpenAI had uh, scraped the New York Times articles to further enhance its, its models. Um, some artists once again, uh, uh, different uh, tools that generate images uh, because these had been trained with their own material uh, without their permission. Uh, same story with Getty Images, uh, where these, these images were used to train st the stability AI's uh, models. So what you want to do, the, the, the way to address this uh, from your perspective is to make sure that uh, these large language models or, or different tools that you're using with generative AI are trained on properly licensed data and they're not infringing copyright uh, material uh, legislation so that uh, you're free from these concerns. You may want to go into legal consultation internally um, to understand the potential implication of using these model within a specific context uh, because it, it, it's hard sometimes for legal departments to provide a blanket statement about using a certain model, but if you give them the intended use case, um, that may help them uh, provide you with a better suited recommendation. So that's uh, the legal risk uh, related to uh, Gen AI. Another one that's, that's pretty critical is compliance. And so the issue is that large language models generate open-ended answers. You don't, necessarily have full control over the answer that is going to be generated because these models are using probabilities to select what would be the most probable sequence of words that would complete the prompt and the prompt being for example the question and so they extend and and complete that but it's always uh, looking at probabilities. And so it's never the same. It's not going to be necessarily the same answer uh, for uh, depending on the question and how it was phrased. Although the intent might be the same uh, if you think of a, of a client that comes and interacts with a chatbot, for example. Um, so this, this probabilistic nature of the answer is is driving a lot of concern uh, because you can't answer ensure the quality um, of the answer but also um, there's been this uh, this issue that's been reported regarding what's called hallucinations where facts are being created entirely um, some examples of that so air canada had a chatbot that promised a discount that wasn't available so you can link tie that to uh, for example, a customer that comes online asks regarding coverage um, and is told that coverage is available and then suddenly uh, after a claim realizes that he's not covered for, for such uh, such cover coverage. Um, and so that, that, that's a clear uh, element that you want to have a very good control over. Um, JP Morgan used Gen AI to produce market anal analysis reports uh, that had errors uh, in them, and so they had to go through manual corrections to make sure that they were accurate. Um, CNET publishes lots of articles on tech. Uh, they use gener generative AI to write articles that included in 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 inaccuracies um, and also uh, that, that worked pleasantly plagiarism, uh, so copying from other uh, others' content. 
Um, so the solutions, so first uh, there's, there's a, quite a few. Uh, the first one is to have manual oversight and review, um, but that's not the intent if you're looking or considering uh, automation of certain tasks or actions. Um, and so that could be prohibitively costly for you to manually oversee everything that is being produced by the Gen AI. Um, regular retraining and fine tuning of, of the large, man, large language models so that they're more up to date with recent information. Uh, prompt engineering, so that's essentially uh, surrounding a question or surrounding a prompt by um, by a potentially a client that interacts with a virtual agent, uh, surrounding that prompt so that it adds context and in, uh, increases the probability that the answer will remain within that context. Verification mechanism, so cross-checking means cross-checking against databases for validity of information, and cross-verification -ver is, is the idea of using multiple large language models um, and to make sure that they, if they, they all agree to the same, uh, then uh, that gives you com higher confidence that this is a right answer. Um, and finally, model restrictions are providing guardrails that limit the model scope so that it stays within a bounded context um, and will refrain from answering questions that may be out of scope. Um, and so these are potential solution regarding compliance, but what's important is to um, retain that generative AI uh, is not providing fixed answers or fixed content. It's providing probabilistically good content, but you need to have comfort uh, with the fact that this may not be fitting exactly what you, you want uh, to be. Uh, the content that is provided. Uh, maybe I can pause and, you know, I've gone through four risks. I don't know if there are some comments regarding these. If anyone wants to jump in, I know there's uh, there's lots of people on the call and, and makes it difficult a bit, but if anyone wants to mention uh, a comment on these risks so far, otherwise I can move along. Um, so bias risk has been around for a long time. Uh, even with predictive modeling, uh, there might be some bias in the data. It's true for, for predictive modeling, it's true for uh, traditional AI, and it's also true for generative AI. So there are different categories of bias, um, and I'll go through them quickly. Uh, so training data bias is, is the fact that the stereotypes uh, that are prevalent within the data that was used to develop the models will apply or um, uh, be included within the model themselves. And so if you have gender bias uh, or, or uh, age bias or different types of biases uh, that were present in the data, they will also apply to the model itself and the generated content. Uh, representation bias is related to opinions. For example, uh, if uh, if you have uh, political opinions that are more represented in, in the data, uh, that will impact the model itself. The al algorithmic bias looks at the different components of the model development, uh, the various stages, starting from the data itself all the way to the model deployment. And during these steps, there might be some bias induced in the model in the pro through that process that may eventually apply to the generated content. So you can think of, for example, sampling of your data or how the data was processed for missing information uh, and labeling the data. And so the way it was labeled or the people that label the data may have their own biases uh, that will be applied and then further downstream be uh, included in the model. Um, the training object model architecture and training objective also 
impactful on uh, on the model outputs. The interaction bias refers to uh, prompts or questions that are maybe asked um, that will be leading uh, so that the answer can be biased by the prompt itself. Uh, deployment bias is related to the context in which the model is deployed. So if you deploy, if you train a model, uh, say for example, with uh, uh, a certain accent of English and deploy it in a different uh, location, uh, that the performance of the model will likely uh, drop as it has to deal with different accents. Uh, reinforcement bias is this idea that if you're using a model to generate data, uh, uh, artificial data that is to be used by another model for training purposes, um, then whatever bias is present in the original model used to generate the data will transfer to that generated data and then, and then eventually to the new model. So it's kind of reinforcement and it's feedback loop of, of bias that percolates from one model to another. Um, so lots of examples, again, re regarding uh, um, bias. Uh, so Google Translate uh, have gender bias. So if it started from a gender neutral language map and translated to uh, a language that had gender to be included, there might be some bias regarding gender. Um, you can uh, also mention Amazon well known use case, uh, a well known case of bias in predictive models. So uh, Amazon recruiting tool had been found to favor male candidates. Uh, so that's an example. Um, and so there are different ones. I, don't, I won't go through all of them. So the solutions. So you want to ensure that your data is diverse and representative. Um, so that may be difficult to implement it. I mean, typically you have data. You'll use all the data that you have as, mu as much as possible. Um, and so once you're there, there's no other data to, to, to be had. And so it's it's mostly about identifying these biases that are present and dealing with them. Um, algorithmic fairness uh, during training and model development is paired with the algorithmic bias. So the idea is to make sure that at every step uh, you ensure that you're not including bias. Biased uh, detection and correction techniques are available. Um, the, the, the issue is that if, if uh, you have to specify which, which variable you want to detect uh, a, bi a potential bias for. So you, you have to list them out and say, this is gender. I want to see if they're biased regarding gender, age, uh, race, religion, and so on. Um, there's no blanket solution to unbiased against anything. Um, and so that forces you to identify these, these potential biases and then address them. Um, transparency um, can help uh, to understand the limitations of the models. So once you've developed the model, just to understand how it was developed, what was the source of the data, how it was developed and then how it was deployed allows you to understand the end-to-end -end process uh, and that transparency allows you to potentially see if some bias might be present in the model. Um, and then you want to continuously monitor and update the models so that they have uh, the most recent information. Um, so that's bias and then fakes. Uh, Fakes, as in sh either shallow fakes or deep fakes, is this idea that, uh, and this is regarding external parties uh, that may use fakes against insurers. The shallow fakes are uh, are obtained by apl simply applying changes to existing content, so that may be a picture that has been engineered with a certain tool to show some uh, damage so that a claim can be made against that damage. Uh, and deep fakes will uh, generate entirely new content uh, from a simple description. 
Um, so an example, uh, license plates of total loss vehicles can be modified so that they will um, represent the total loss vehicle uh, with the license plate that is on a certain policy and then there can be a claim against a total loss. That's an example. Um, completely fabricated, so that would be deep fakes. Uh, repair invoices, uh, reports, repair estimates, and so on. Um, so this is a trend that seems to be growing in the market. Uh, I don't know if you've seen some cases of this, uh, but the solutions, one costly solution is to increase your checks and validation on the documents that are received. For example, calling the vendors to validate that uh, certain uh, work was done, uh, but that may be difficult to, it costs certainly costly to implement. Um, more detailed searches on property individual uh, involved in, in a claim. Um, and then there's, uh, there's software out there to allow you to detect fakes uh, and detect engineering uh, that may have happened on, on certain content. But then it becomes a cat cat and mouse situation because then tools to generate fakes uh, get better. And so uh, fake detection tools need to catch up and, and keep uh, keep improving to match uh, the new tools for fake uh, engineering. So yeah, you can vote uh, for the one that is most concerning. So there's privacy, and inter intellectual property risk, legal risk, compliance risk, um, and then part two should have, part two has bias risk, fakes, uh, and then some other risk that may, I may not have discussed, but you feel is, is the most uh, concerning to you. Well, I don't know if anyone wants to discuss, jump in and discuss these risks, or maybe if you want to mention a risk uh, that you'd like to add some comments. I see Alistair has uh, his hands raised. Yeah, so, thanks uh, so much. I, I think the uh, list of risks that you've provided here is super helpful. So for the folks on this uh, call, uh, I think we have to assume that we're on the kind of downside evaluation side of the insurance proposition. Uh, and so understanding uh, that uh, there will be lots of folks looking for ways to leverage these awesome new tools. Uh, the group here are all uh, being asked and tasked with thinking through the worst case and how do you mitigate. And mm -hmm. so uh, as, I, as I think about this, um, all of the big data analytics part of mass computational power was very attractive to the insurance industry because mm -hmm. you know you were always looking for ways to spot patterns, uh, and if you can spot patterns better, you can do a better job of risk selection and pricing. And so we kind of had this kind of uh, battle for more actuarial firepower, uh, and obviously big data analytics offered uh, a way to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the generative side struck me as being really getting closer to making the computer replicate human behavior in such a way as to improve customer service and or uh, reduce expenses. Uh, sure. And so if you think of generative AI as primarily um, an enhanced service proposition or a expense reduction proposition, the risks that you cited around compliance risk, bias risk uh, are, are a big deal. I mean, it, it makes it feel to me almost uh, like uh, early movers here are taking greater risk. Uh, and it would be better and safer to wait until these tools get um, better and let uh, our competitors uh, make the mistakes and experience the, the risks associated. Uh, is there an early mover advantage for applying these tools? Um. Yeah, I think so, because uh, then you get more for it's a journey, so um, you want to get onto that journey and start learning and and uh, your organization needs to get more familiar with it. I think it's uh, it's a matter of properly sequencing 
that journey. And I think starting with internal use cases, a very low, lower risk. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to think of, you know, let's let's look at meeting summary uh, and then claims note, claims conversation summary. Is that uh, is that capturing all the relevant information? Um, and so there might be use cases and then you you should look at use cases where you have a human in the loop, which is less risky because you have you always have full review. And so starting from use cases that are less risky along these different classifications that I mentioned is going to allow you to look at these use cases, gradually understand how it, they work uh, and then evolve. And once you get to use cases that are external facing with clients, the one you mentioned about customer service, you, win, you may want to box these models into a very uh, small sandbox initially. So addressing um, admin cases, you know, I want to, I want to make uh, a change or, or or whatever, and and soon make sure that uh, if any question comes out of scope, then it's quickly addressed by a human, um, and you have this smooth transition. And so having this uh, this uh, hybrid solution where some of the work gets picked up by the Gen AI, and most is picked up by humans, and then gradually you can start. Uh, start increasing the footprint of your Gen AI models, but definitely you want to get started and it's just a matter of sequencing. Very helpful. Ian, I have, I have one more, uh, unless there's somebody else. Sure, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump to the chat, but Alistair, you, you go ahead. Yep. Just, thanks. Uh, so uh, with regard to the fakes, uh, I think our industry has been uh, migrating uh, effectively to do more claims adjusting digitally uh, or through a desk adjuster who's simply taking a look at uh, submitted documentation and associated photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the extent to which uh, we end up in a cat and mouse game with regard to uh, fakery and the ability to spot the fake uh, it feels to me rather like the, the contest we're in with uh, cyber insurance against the cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this constant effort to improve uh, the quality of uh, security and detection. And we're all getting trained not to click. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we've all been moving to models with more digitized claims. Uh, so it strikes me that the next growth industry out of this is going to be fake detection to help protect the insurance industry from fraud? Um, yeah, it could, could be. Uh, I mean, I don't know the extent of, uh, of the work that's been done or the attempts at uh, fake generation. I, I would assume that there's got a lot, be a lot happening on, on, the, uh, uh, on the bodily sides or um, with clinics and all of these, uh, um, and so, so if you think of group health benefits on the life and life and health side, um, I would assume that this is an area where there might be a lots of, of fakes happening. I don't know about the PNC industry where uh, if anyone wants to jump in, I'm not aware of the uh, the extent of these these attempts. People have comment out there on that. Please put up your hand. And. There was a, a couple of questions, Charles, in the chat here. Do you see any actuarial applications as it relates to pricing, reserving, or risk management using AI in the future? And could you possibly foresee how this use or how this could be useful in the short, mid, or long term? Uh, so yeah, there's there's different uh, aspects. So we talked about uh, so for pricing, there's complex. Uh, there are some complex features. It, it may be difficult to, uh, what I would say is, you may extract features, use AI to extract features of different elements, and these features become part of your pricing. So that's one way to see it, uh, where AI can help. AI can be the, the model itself, but then, um, that brings lots of challenges uh, where um, you may have reversal on, on the pricing side, and then you want to make sure that you're able to control for that. Um, so 
that's that's for pricing for reserving. We talked about uh, simulations with Gen AI, so Gen AI could could help you generate more realistic scenarios uh, that allow you to uh, project your claims and and then uh, develop reserving. And that's also true for uh, uh, minimum capital capital requirements or financial uh, projections uh, and risk management. Uh, same, uh, I mean, there's there's scenario testing uh, that can be more realistic. Um, so AI can be can play different roles um, in extracting information, provide you with the the the, the, the extracted features, or um, it can play a much bigger role in being the exact uh, the, the the full model itself. Are there other questions before Charles goes on here? I think back to you, Charles. Sure, I'm almost done, actually. The um, I think the last slides is is about limitations. They're not risks on their own. They can eventually per become risks, uh, but they're limitations of large language models. Um, so uh, first one is lack of true understanding. So these are really uh, statistical models. They've been trained on patterns and, and identified patterns, uh, and that's what they're able to replicate. And, and the fact that they don't understand is if they have learned something in a, in a given context, they're not able to maybe understand that uh, what they've learned is not applicable in a new reality, which humans would be able to do. Um, so you need to be cautious about that. Lack of inter interpretability and, and transparency. So it's very like you're familiar for sure with uh, generalized uh, linear models where you have all your relativities. It's very easy to uh, apply interpretation to these models. That's a that's the best example I can think of for a model that's easily interpretable. Um, Gen AI on the opposite have billions and even trillions of parameters. Uh, you can't conceivably extract uh, a reasoning, end-to-end -end reasoning uh, from these models. It's very difficult uh, to justify a decision. Um, so they lack this interpretability and transparency of their reasoning. Lack of long-term context and consistency. So that's the idea that large language model may not be able to capture all the context that is relevant to a certain interaction, uh, but that's less and less of a concern, assuming you have the budget to uh, uh, to have these more capable models. So for example, recently uh, Google came with their new model, which has uh, 2 million tokens of context. So what that allows you to consider is when you have a large enough model, you can include all of the previous interactions with a client. So all the previous calls that you may have had um, can, once the, that client comes, for example, again, thinking of a virtual assistant, the client comes online, initiates an interaction, they they initially authenticate themselves. Once they've authenticated, you can load up all of the previous interactions, phone calls, emails, everything, and that gives the virtual assistant all the context of the, the interaction with that client in order to address their concern at the moment. Um, so initially, you know, if they're in a the process of a claim, obviously that's probably because they want to ha have an update on their claim or they want to mention something about their claim. So that's going to be easy for the virtual assistant to grasp. Um, so that ability to grasp the full context is going to be an important component and, and the, the models that are coming out are more and more capable of doing that. Uh, adapting to changes is challenging. So if you think of how you've done the fine tuning of your model, you've taken the historical database that you have, for example, your call center recordings. All of that has been digitized. 
uh, you've used that to train your model to understand what should be the uh, the interaction how sh that should be conducted and suddenly you have a change in legal a change in processes because the company has decided to change the process or new products or uh, some products being uh, discontinued or uh, changes in regarding the coverages well these changes are not this new environment is not reflected in your historical data that was used to develop the model so you have to go back and address that issue because your model is no longer relevant to the new world. Um, and so you have to uh, decide how you're going to address that, how you're going to retrain. Now, the, the in, if it's a recent change, you don't have the data to train that model with. Um, so that brings a bit of a, a challenge. So you may decide to uh, limit the scope of the model um, so that it doesn't uh discuss certain coverages or certain aspects or certain processes uh and then and then make sure that humans are addressing these cases that have been changed as a temporary measure once you've gathered enough data then you can retrain your model and adapt it and then uh, resume uh, the scope that it's able to address uh, talent shortage is one there's not enough uh people going around that can um uh, work with these models and and keep up with everything that's coming out uh, so that's something you need to think of resource intensive though so these models and uh, the largest ones and there are smaller ones more that can be more specific to certain tasks that are going to be less costly but that's certainly something you want to look at is models are very different in their sizes and their costs of, of usage. And so cost is going to be important component uh, if you use the largest models. Um, and also that's an ESG impact because uh, they do uh, require lots of energy to run uh, and that's an impact on environment. So these are some of the limitations. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank you for listening in. Uh, you can reach me at the address at the bottom, that's my email, or uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd be happy to have a discussion um, at any point in time. We will definitely put that in the uh, in the follow-up communication to members. I, I see, Alistair, you have your hand up. Sorry, just one more, uh, Charles. I think your last slide um, is uh, very therapeutic. Uh, for those of us who have been uh, trying to think through where does humanity fit in uh, by the end of uh, this year uh, and this uh, <laughs> uh, current uh, AI boom uh, and the limitations that you've just cited are, are substantial. Uh, and uh, the one in the top left corner of your uh, last slide there about lack of true understanding. I'm picturing some uh, generative AI being trained uh, on your presentation today and what would it actually make of this uh, obstacle to it being more effective because it doesn't have true understanding would it be able to understand that at all it just uh, struck me as being a, a fascinating yeah. example so, uh, yeah, so enough of the ramble here's a quick question um if i am uh thinking about the insurance sector the uh, two best opportunities for leveraging this in your mind today uh, and the one thing to remember uh, to not do. Um, best use cases, I think, are, uh, I would start with tasks. Um, there's, there's usually, you can think of some tasks that are repetitive, uh, that are time consuming, uh, and I would aim for that because typically these are low risk they will be internal use cases um and they can greatly uh benefit your organizations and it's quick roi typically when you reduce time to uh, run a task uh, so that's one um if we really want to look at um uh, use cases for um interactions with clients i think uh 
you may want to you may want to use a, a chatbot that is able to address generic questions regarding uh, the products that you offer or insurance in general. So an insurance chatbot that is not addressing core transactions that you want to have, like buying an insurance or making a, a policy change, which may lead you into issues. And so if you're if you're keeping yourself within that scope that is more generic, uh, that allows you. And also what's interesting is that you can capture these interactions, right? And learn from that and see what clients, what are clients asking? Uh, what are they uh, trying to, to achieve when they come online? And once you get that, these interactions, you can gradually improve uh, your capabilities uh, for, for these interactions. Um, that's uh, that would be two use cases that I think would be interesting. What was the last question? The, <laughs> the two one, use cases the, the and one, one thing mistake. not to do. The one thing not to do. That's right. Well, I, I would say refrain from going all out with uh, you know deploying use cases uh, external facing with clients without going through the proper steps of. Uh, validating with compliance, uh, legal, and so on, and making sure that you're comfortable with the potential risk. And I would say that before you get there, you really want to ramp up and and properly sequence your different Gen AI use cases. And so I guess the answer is don't do the wrong sequence, do the right one. Thank you. And we have companies large and small uh, Charles, do you, is this a big company issue or is this like, can small companies be doing this as well? Is this right? Yeah, for sure. Right I mean, the this, it's uh, the same story as AI. You may not, as a small company, you may not be able to attract the talent for Gen AI, but you'll, there's certainly some vendors out there. It's just a matter of uh, finding the ones that can help you with uh, navigate this environment and see what's uh, what's applicable to you, to your organization. And I see Jeff has a, a question uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, are there AI models that don't retain personally identifiable information, for instance, after processing claims notes? Well, I would I would advise to have anonymization as part of your process before using the large language model. Uh, the other element is if you're using a model that is open, you can deploy it within your own environment, so that's no longer a concern. Um, and then if you really want to use a model that may keep your data, then you want to look at the terms of use and how they anonymize the data and so on, but that's that would be the, the very last resort. Right. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, that's probably a good time to wrap up. Charles, thanks very much for coming back. It's been six years of since course. we saw you, but there's been great developments since then, and I think you've just kind of primed everybody on the current risks and opportunities for their firms. And I think that's uh, super, super helpful. So thanks very much for being here today. Again, everyone out there, I will uh, pass along Charles' contact information to you. So if you do have discussion uh, sidebar you want with uh, Charles, we have that for you. And just I'll, I'll take a quick look. Thanks, Danica, for putting up the upcoming Risk Officers Forum events. We're doing a webinar. Uh, was scheduled for the 24th. There's uh, an issue. We have a conflict, so we're going to bump it back a week. And we're looking at per and polyfluoral alkyl substances and two forum meetings to close the year that uh, our next event is the September 19th forum meeting and then the November 28th forum meeting. More information to follow on that. There is a satisfaction survey that we're going to post to everybody uh, today or tomorrow, later on today or tomorrow. Your feedback certainly helps us to um, uncover speakers and topics and uh, judge what worked and what didn't. And polling we're going to work on, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, we had some uh, baby steps on that today, but I uh, appreciate uh, Danica's work behind the, the scenes to solve all that. And so thanks very much, everyone, for being on the broadcast. Um, enjoy your summer. We'll be back in touch. We hope to see you in September, and uh, we'll, we'll close out now. Thanks very much. Take care.